Welcome to the Asking Why podcast. I'm your host, Clint Davis. And uh, if you're watching on video, we have a new podcast room, so I'm excited about that. Um, if you're not watching on video, then you're just listening, then it doesn't matter. So uh, today I have my good friend, one of my best friends in the entire world, Ashley Rochelle, on the podcast. She is an RD, which is a registered dietitian and a... Certified Intuitive Eating Counselor. There we go. So Ashley's been with us. We were looking back. You, you were on episode 15, mm-hmm. and we're on episode 125. So it's been a while. Um, although me and you have had yeah. these conversations lots of times in between now and then. So uh, last time you came on with Rachel Haynes and we talked a little bit about intuitive eating and what was that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you've learned a lot, I'm sure, in the last couple of years since yeah. doing that. Because I think that was almost two years ago that we did that episode, a year and a half. Yeah, I think so. Yep. So welcome. Thank uh, you. Yeah, tell Happy me. To be here. Yeah, tell me. Tell us who you are for those who've forgotten in the last 110 <laughs> episodes. And sure. yeah, your story. Sure. Okay. Well, um, like Clint said, I'm Ashley and, um, you know, my, uh, story or path that kind of led me to becoming a dietitian and doing the type of work that I do, um, was always just kind of knowing, um, like having a special interest in nutrition, but especially when I was a kid and a teenager and really not having that come from a good place either, Mm -hmm. you know, having my own struggles with body image and my relationship with food throughout my teenage years and into early, um, twenties. And just kind of, you know, trying to navigate that, especially once I followed down the path to become a dietitian, mm-hmm. which if you're struggling, I'm not sure that I recommend going down that route because it can be very toxic very quickly. All these yeah. things that you're learning can be a weapon and not a tool. And so, you know, for me, it became a tool to help me get better in some ways, but still struggling in other ways. And so, you know, it really wasn't until I found intuitive eating for the first time and, um, you know, kind of learn more about that and what that meant, uh, that really allowed me to fully heal that relationship with food and, um, to be able to inform and do the work that I do today. So, you know, not only my lived experience lets me, um, work with clients in that way, but also all the things that I've learned, um, from that route of like the anti-diet culture movement. Mm -hmm. So for people who are listening, can you explain just generally what intuitive eating Mm -hmm. and why that's different than like Diet culture. Everything else, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I very simply like to describe intuitive eating as the way that you were born knowing how to eat. Uh-huh. Um, so intuitively? That's, yes, eating intuitively. Um, you know, think about babies. Like, no one has to teach a baby how to eat. They know how to communicate their needs. They know how to listen to their bodies. They naturally gravitate towards variety if given variety. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, no one had to teach them that. And that is the way that we're all born, knowing how to nourish our bodies. We have that innate wisdom on how to nourish our bodies, although many people's lived experience, it doesn't feel that way anymore. Mm -hmm. And I blame diet culture for that. It creates a lot of confusion out there on, like, how to properly nourish ourselves. But we were born knowing how to do that. And so intuitive eating is a a process. It was developed by two dietitians, um, Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch. And um, they, you know, saw from their work with clients that like the traditional method of teaching people about food and focusing on weight loss and all that just wasn't working. It Mm -hmm. wasn't helping people. And when was that? Yeah. Oh, when did they write the book? Yeah. Or when did they kind of start thinking about that? Uh, It's been around for a long time. Um, I didn't look at the exact date, but I would say at least the past 15 years okay. or so. So this is not new. Well, yeah. so you say that, but mm-hmm. like it is new. Yeah. You know, 15 years is yeah. nothing in the course of like food and culture. So that is I true. think about the same thing with trauma. To me, it's not mm-hmm. new Yeah. because I've been working with it since grad school. But, you know, in the scope of like the therapists that I work with that are here, that are in society, that have done pod, you know, well not podcasts, but have written books, who have mm-hmm. started to do podcasts, who have been in the field for 50 years of therapy. Yeah. There was a lot of work and cultural shifts and um, teachings and paradigms mm-hmm. that were created with therapy that in 15 years, you know, we haven't yeah. undone. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would say intuitive eating is relatively new in the scope of like, all things, although it's not like in the last two years, right? It's not right. like a new fad or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it take, it just shows how long it takes to get into the culture because mm-hmm. even trauma, as much as we have Instagram and podcasts and things talking about it. Yeah. I mean, I get clients every day, you know, within our practice to be like, Hey, do you know what trauma is? And they're like, no, you mm-hmm. know? So would you say that's kind of the same thing that when people come in, yeah, what do they know? What yeah. do they not know? Most people have never heard the term intuitive eating. Right. 
um, you know, some of them have, and it's usually social media that's really kind of exposed them to that, mm. which is great. Um, but yeah, most people have never heard of anything like that. And, and just to give, you know, people some perspective, like I said, I said 15 years, it's probably been around longer than that because yeah. I've been a dietitian for 15 years and I'd never heard of it until mm. eight years ago. <laughs> And so that just to tells you like how long it takes for things to become mainstream, just like you were saying, because I'm in this, you know, area. And so for me to not have that exposure until, you know, eight years ago, just kind of speaks to like how difficult it is for the non-conventional things to kind of break into the mainstream. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Hmm. Well, because... I mean, honestly, I think it comes down to a lot of funding, yeah, right? Be honest. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that it is because there's not any funding for intuitive eating. There's lots of funding for specific diet pl pl plans and programs, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever gets the funds, gets the money and it gets the coverage in the media. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as popular because it doesn't produce short term, quick results. Mm -hmm. Um, it's more of a long-term process working relational, re goodness, relationally in your relationship with food. Um, and so, you know, that's something that takes a lot of time to develop. And so all of these other programs, um, might have sponsors and backing and, you know, all the finances to have the research and data that's out there. Although there is great research out there to support intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just not as widely publicized, I think because okay. of that. So can you give me an example of something that you see is really toxic that like has, has benefited from like funding and marketing that you look at and it makes you cringe and annoyed. Mm -hmm. I can give one. So for me, yeah. it would be and, and that you, for me, you know, I wouldn't say that it like CBT, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. it's kind of the thing you learn in grad school that you hear yeah. about from everybody that if you don't know and you're a therapist is super problematic mm -hmm. and yet it is effective in certain areas and it's generally, you know, not harmful, yeah. but it's not the end all be all to all things. Right. Right. And it's a little tiny piece of the puzzle, but it's not, it's, it's not in some ways damaging. Right. Mm -hmm. But with a diet, I would say, or I'm asking you, yeah. is there things that you go, okay, that just isn't beneficial at all. Or is there, it's beneficial in little tiny pockets, mm. you know, yeah. What's the deal with like all these yeah. diets? Um, I would say the first example that came to mind was the keto diet. Okay. Um, you just came out the gate swinging. That's right. Uh, Step on all the toes. That's right. Oops. Um, yeah. So, you know, the ketogenic diet is something that had a lot of research specifically for children and epilepsy. And it was shown to be effective, albeit difficult to follow. Um, especially for kids. I mean, imagine that, but uh, what is, so yeah. what is keto? Uh, so, you know, keto, well, keto as is, as it exists for kids with epilepsy is very different than what we see as like the keto diet today. Okay. Um, and so, you know, it's designed to keep the body in ketosis and for kids with epilepsy, it actually helps to reduce the amount of seizures that they have. So what is ketosis? Yeah. So, uh, ketosis is something that, um, like, it's your body utilizing a, a different source of fuel. So, you know, with the keto diet, it's the um, elimination of carbohydrates in order for your body to stay in a place where it burns ketones for fuel instead of burning carbohydrates for fuel. Because your body's prefer, preferred form of fuel it comes from carbohydrates. Glucose mm -hmm. is what it breaks down to. And so, you know, the premise now and how it's kind of been warped is for the ketogen ketogenic diet is to um, allow your body to use fat for fuel instead of using carbs for fuel. Mm -hmm. um, and that is actually very problematic because most people- <laughs> Why is that bad? <laughs> well, you know, first and foremost, most people are not actually staying in <clears throat> ketosis, you know, without um, testing for that, which is usually like a urine test. Mm -hmm. um, without testing for that, you actually don't know if you're in ketosis or not. And so what they're really following is kind of like a modified or an extreme form of a low carbohydrate diet. And, um, are, like, and that's bad. Um, I try to avoid using black and white Unhealthy. terms, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, low carb diets are something that for most people are going to be, um, uh, just really difficult to stay on, like unsustainable, right? Okay. 
because, you know, carbohydrates are a wide variety of food. It's like one of the biggest categories, right, of, of different types of foods that are out there. And so you're eliminating huge portions of the food that's available for you to eat. Yeah. So this yeah. gets in my mind's going, uh, well, one, I know nothing about what you're talking about. Yeah. So as a therapist and as a person who works out and tries to take care of himself and all those things, yeah. I'm thinking, okay, I'm trying to catch up in my brain with what half of these words mean. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, you realize yeah. like, oh, I have a body and it has all of these things and I know very yeah. little about it. So it's like, that's the yeah. sad thing. One is that we, you know, like as human beings, we don't even know how we work. Right. Uh, and like all of the fitness people are like, you're an idiot. But I'm like, I, I mean, the reality is, is like when it comes to valuing our bodies, if we don't know how they work, then we can't mm. really manage them. And so we just yeah. listen to whatever thing in the culture has been taught to us. Yeah. And then we go, okay. Yeah, I don't want to eat bread because bread's bad, right? Mm -hmm. Like, or I don't want to eat yeah. ice cream because ice cream's bad, or like, and and you know, you get on to me about this all the time, but <laughs> I know what it's like to be a friend of a therapist yeah. now. So we've been friends forever, and I know what it's like as a therapist. You know, when people say unhealthy things, right? Yeah. You try not to redirect them all the time, but being your friend, like I've realized how many negative. Think, views negative views that I have of my body, of bodies, like of mm -hmm. our language that comes up when we talk about things as we've parented together, yeah. you know, and raising kids together. It's like, man, it's so easy to say something pretty negative or shaming, yeah. completely unintentional mm -hmm. because of just the long history. It's like, I'm yeah. very intentional from a psychological perspective not to do that, <laughs> right? And sometimes we right. have to, I'm like, yeah. with, with your husband or with you, or, you know, I'll have to say, well, say it this way or whatever. And then vice versa. You know, mm -hmm. you're like, well, let, maybe we shouldn't say make a happy plate or maybe we shouldn't say eat all of this before that. And then it's like, yeah. well, why? And we, we've yeah. had lots of these conversations that I've learned a ton, which I highly value. Yeah. But my point is, is that I think when it comes to the diets and culture, just like with emotions and psychology and, and how we work, m people just have no clue. Mm -hmm. And so as we talk about like all of these things, there's lots of people with opinions who will listen to this podcast and go, well, that's trash. You know? Yeah. She's crazy. Yeah. Keto is fine. This is fine. Yeah. Whatever. But it's like, if you start to actually sit with them and ask them what they know about the body and how it works, mm -hmm. you know, they probably don't have a very full knowledge. They're assuming that the doctors and the dietitians who have all this training, who have went to grad school, who yeah. have degrees are telling them the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the problem is, is like all of those systems in some way, shape or form, yeah. Are bought into cultures that sell products, create systems, sell, I mean, even sell grad schools. Right. right. Oh, yeah. To produce people who can then market their thing for them. Would you agree? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'd agree with that. Yeah. So you say keto, and we're talking about ketosis and ketosis, how do you say it? Mm -hmm. And keeping your body in a certain place. And yeah, we, I mean, initially, I mean, I think everybody goes, yeah, carbs are bad. Yeah. Right. But, and you're like, well, they switch from carbs to burn fat mm -hmm. with what's that's the theory, right? That's yeah. the theory. Yeah. So what do we do with that? Like, how do we, how do we help people or how are you helping people switch their mind state and how do people listen to this who maybe have no clue? Um, you know, yeah. why does intuitive eating switch all of that to a different perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if someone's coming to me with either a history of being on any diet, doesn't matter, you know, but if we're talking about keto specifically, Oh, I know what I was going to say. Sorry. Yeah. To interrupt no, you. that's okay. Um, I guess that, that base, the, 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 the problem is, is it's the, what's the end result you're looking for, right? Isn't mm -hmm. that like the problem? Yeah. So if you're going, well, get on keto, not because you have, what did you say the kids have? Epilepsy. Not because you have epilepsy, but because you want yeah. abs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that if the goal is, if the goal is wrong mm -hmm. and from an unhealthy perspective, then it, yeah. is that why the whole thing falls apart? You know? Yeah. Like that's an important aspect of this is okay. that, you know, um, some clients, when they come to me, like what they desire weight loss, right? That's mm -hmm. one of the primary reasons why they're showing up in my office. And so, you know, I make it very clear to them, the desire for your body to change is not wrong especially in our culture that we live in, or maybe you're experiencing discomfort in your body, or, you know, you have felt more energized at a, a smaller, or, you know, in a smaller body or at a, a lower weight, right? Mm -hmm. um, that desire is not wrong, but it can't be the primary focus mm. because that's like in the world of psychology, that's the equivalent of behavior change. Mm. And most of the time that's not sustainable, right? It has to be 
a heart change or a mindset change, right? Like something in you has to change the way that you're viewing um, whatever you're trying to accomplish. So I tell people like, your desire isn't wrong, but let's shift that to the back burner Mm -hmm. where it's not the primary focus, right? If, if that worked, then when you've been on previous diets in your life, that would have been the end. You would have been one diet done. That changed everything for you, but it didn't work because that's a short term unsustainable thing. So that's what I mean when I say like the, you know, it's the pursuit of intentional weight loss, AKA dieting, Mm -hmm. right? that isn't sustainable and that long-term isn't the way to go. Now, if you focus on like engaging in health promoting behaviors, then, you know, and that's all these things of self-care, right? So health promoting behaviors might be, it might include the foods that you eat, right? Um, So including more nutrient dense foods and foods that make your body feel really good, right? Um, It could be movement. That's my word for physical activity or exercise um, Mm -hmm. because those are like, you know, also heavy words. Yeah. Right. Um, so movement, sleep, stress, emotional and spiritual health, those are all your foundational, um, aspects of health. And so when those things are in place, your body will do whatever it's going to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have to trust that our bodies will do what it's, it's going to do when you're taking care of yourself. So it's rooted in self care versus rooted in my primary focus is shrinking my body. Yeah, when you say it's going to do whatever it's going to do, like it's going to lose weight, it's going to shape up, like what what do you mean it's going to (laughs) do? Great question. So if someone has been in a pattern of like restriction for a really long time, they might actually be what we call weight suppressed. Um, And so that means that whatever behaviors they've been engaged in has suppressed their bodies at a lower weight than what their natural set point would be. Mm. So when they start doing these things, you know, engaging in health promoting behaviors, right? If they start down the the path of intuitive eating, they might actually gain weight. And for others that are already within their set point range, they might stay the same. And then for some others still, you know, maybe they were um, engaging in like emotional eating or weren't connected to their fullness and were eating kind of outside of their hunger levels, things like that. Um, they might, after they connect back to their body through intuitive eating, they might release that that extra weight that they'd been carrying around. And so that's what I always make clear to my clients is that I don't know what your body's going to do, but mm-hmm. there has to be an element of trust that your body is smarter. It was designed very beautifully to be able to do, you know, things in this world. And so, you know, we have to trust that whenever you're taking care of yourself in this way and you're not you're not dieting, you're not restricting, you're not over-exercising, you're not binging, all of these things that your body will naturally kind of settle at what's right and what's best for your body. And so, yeah, it can definitely change. And I never promise my clients, you're going to lose weight if you do intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. Um, Because at the root of it, intuitive eating is not a diet. It's not designed for that. So why do you think it's gotten so off the rails? Like what with your clients when you see people come in yeah are they able to you know stick to that more uh be happier and like Mm. what's the byproduct of intuitive eating versus yeah you know yeah and what you're saying is is that when we work out let's say our goal is to get in better shape Mm -hmm. right um what does that mean like that's the question right yeah and so i think it's it's inside of relationship is where these things happen. I think that's, you know, we talk about this all the time. Like you're basically doing counseling to some degree, Mm -hmm. right. With your clients. It's like, you're not, you're not saying I'm a psychotherapist, but you are talking to them about their emotions and their family and their system Mm -hmm. and and looking at how food, right. Has played into this circumstance and how their view of food and their food and their relationship with food. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be taught to them by parents, right? Yeah. Is that the main thing that you see? Is that they learned from Mm -hmm. culture, TV or movies or Mm -hmm. parents like. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, in our initial appointment, the first thing that we go through is what I call their food story. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I sit down with my client and I ask them, what's what are your earliest memories that you have? You know, like what was food like in your household growing up? Where were meals? Um, Tell me about everyone who lived in your household. What were their relationships like with food and body image? Because, you know, as we know, as parents, our kids are sponges. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They will pick up every little thing that you say, even if you, they weren't even in the room, they, they heard you and they absorb, absorb those messages. And so as parents, like 
you know, we recognize that we can have a significant impact on our kids, even if we're not even talking to them, if we're Mm -hmm. talking around them. And so words really matter or what you're modeling for them really matters. And so, you know, for my clients, yeah, they picked up a lot of messages from other people in their lives. And so it's not always parents, right? It could be a coach. It could be a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, their friend group, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, of course, magazines and, and all billboards, my goodness, uh, these days you can't, you know, turn on the radio without somebody talking around about diets or about bodies. And so I know that's, I know it is hard for you because I know you, but like, it's so (laughs) funny, you know, the areas, the different areas that we all kind of learn about and dive deep into. Yeah. When you, when you look at the secular world and the radio and, Mm -hmm. and media and billboards, all these things you mentioned, I mean, it's not even close to healthy. Mm-mm. You know, when no. it comes to food or sexuality or mental health or family or, yeah. you know, just name something that people spend lots of time and energy, you know, around. Mm-hmm. I mean, diabetes, whatever area that you want to work on. Yeah. And it's like, man, once you get steeped in it, right? And I know you went through this, but I, you know, continue to. It's like, it's hard not to see all the brokenness. Mm-hmm. So how do you, yeah. how do you deal with that? How have you been able to kind of walk through like not being super annoyed with all food things? Cause I mean, we know it from yeah. our having allergy kids. Like that was our first like insight into, mm-hmm. and I know you do too, but it's like you start, you send them to a school where it's super food heavy yeah, and then you mention it. And then like we were at a birthday party this weekend and they were asking us, um, why we stopped going there or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was when they were little, so not the recent school, but like, um, and we were like, well, they had snacks for everything. Everything was super food heavy. And the other parents yeah. like, yeah, we don't have allergies, but it was ridiculous. Like every, every learning opportunity was also filtered with like a donut or a right. snack or candy or, you know, whatever. And we were like, yeah, that's why we had to either bring extra food mm-hmm. or tell them they couldn't have it or make sure it was safe. And it was just exhausting, but it's like, until it's a problem, it's not a problem. Yeah. And so how have you kind of dealt with that on a personal level and how would you advise people who are, you know, dealing with food stuff to, to manage like all the, the exposure, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, diet culture is absolutely everywhere. Like we just talked about, but, um, you know, running everything through the filter of intuitive eating, I think is really helpful. Okay. And so, yeah. So, you know, it would be, um, things, well, one thing I have my clients ask themselves is like, um, does this apply only to me mm-hmm. or does this apply to everyone? And, and so what I mean by that is, is that if you feel like there's a message that you've received or something that you're telling yourself or mm-hmm. that you read, right. Um, would you say the same thing? Like, would you suggest that to the person that you love most in this world? Mm. Right. Like your best friend, your parent, your spouse, like your partner, whatever it is, like, would you say that that's okay for them to do? So if you're reading something that's like, you know, you should never eat carbs again. <laughs> like, would you, would you say that that's okay for your child? Would you say that's okay for your spouse? Mm-hmm. Right. And if it's not, then you know that like, that might be a message that you received that doesn't hold up, right? That that's not true. And so that might be one way to deal with some of those negative messages is to say, you know, does this kind of apply across the board or am I taking that message yeah. a little too far or am I applying it in a way that doesn't actually support my health? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, and, and also, I mean, I would say we're talking in generalities, but mm-hmm. there are times where medically somebody has a mm-hmm. condition or something wrong. Yeah. So how do you help people deal with that? Like when they have to actually yeah. have a diet or do they, is that like a bad idea? Uh, too? No, it's, it's not, it's, it's all on framing, right? So if it's a diet that they're following where, again, the primary goal is weight loss, it will continue to fail. Mm-hmm. But if you've just been diagnosed with this chronic illness um, and, you know, maybe you have a condition that does have dietary factors that are affecting it, um, like maybe it's diabetes or hypertension, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, things like that, like, of course, but that comes from a place of self-care. You're making decisions, and I always recommend to add right? Like what can we add and not necessarily have to take away? So can we add things that are honoring to our health, Mm -hmm. right? Can we add more fruits and vegetables? Can we add, you know, a protein with our carbs to help balance and have more stable blood sugar levels? Those are all things that are going to help you to feel better in your body. In the case of food allergies, right? Like the reason why that is a restriction is because it affects your health. So Mm -hmm. you choosing not to eat those foods 
is a, a form of self-care. That's not a form of restriction. So that's very different than the dieting where it's like removing these things because you want to stay in ketosis or, you know, you want to lose weight or you, whatever, like it's a very different mindset. And so when it's formed in the place of, of self-care, like those decisions are rooted in self-care, then it feels sustainable because you know you feel better in your body when you're not eating your allergen or your blood sugar's not all over the place and you're feeling the effects of that, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the main difference is that it, it's different because your mindset around that is significantly different. So when you think about like, CrossFit or exercises that get super intense about all those kind of things like it, like macros for example I keep hearing about macros and counting yeah. your macros like what what is that how does that fit into diet culture mm-hmm. yeah so counting your macros very simply is just referring to um, the the macronutrients right carbohydrates you fats, say right no I have protein. no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, I'm explaining that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, right? Okay. And so uh, counting your macros is trying to focus on certain percentages of your overall food intake comes from different um, categories, right? So it right. might be, you know, uh, 30% protein, 20% fat, 50% carbs, right? So is that is that necessarily like a bad thing? I wouldn't go as far as to say that that's super negative, but everything for me comes back to, is this sustainable? Do you intend to track every morsel of food that you put into your mouth for the rest of your life? Do you want to keep track of, you know, well, okay, does this food has protein and it has fat in it? So what percentage am I going to give it? Right. And most people are using apps and such to do that. But again, is that something that you sustainably want to do forever? Mm -hmm. For most people, they're like, well, no, I don't want to track everything that I'm eating for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And so. But it may be a time where you have an event or you have something coming up or you, you, you have something that you're just saying, Hey, yeah, I'm going to be super diligent and anal about Mm -hmm. this because I need to be in this shape or this form for this race or this run or this event. Yeah. And then I'm just not going to do it anymore when that's done. Mm. Yeah. I would say that that's very tricky. Yeah, you knew that was coming. You baited me. Um, That's very tricky. So uh, part of what you're kind of alluding to might be like in the form of an athlete Uh and they are performing for a specific sport and that's very different from this conversation. But if we're speaking to the average population, um, kind of doing something for a short amount of time for an event sounds very diety to me. Mm -hmm. And I would just caution people against that because it's the yo-yo dieting effect of like, okay, you drop weight for a certain amount of time because of maybe you are counting macros or you are dieting or you are over-exercising or whatever. Um, well, what happens when you're no longer preparing for that event? Mm -hmm. Like what happens when you no longer want to count calories or you get injured? Well, then your weight's going to rebound. And so what our bodies do is that they try to protect us from the next kind of diet. Essentially, it tries to protect us from that. And so it works by slowing down our metabolism. And most of the time too, it will build in a cushion. Mm -hmm. That cushion comes in the form of weight gain. And so, you know, uh, there's this saying in, in the kind of anti-diet space is that the biggest predictor of weight gain is going on a diet. Mm. <laughs> and it speaks to that idea that like our bodies overall, overall, yeah, um, that our bodies learn to adapt to what it perceives as a famine and mm. it will help build in some extra security in our bodies to help protect us from the next famine that's coming. So I don't recommend that people do that, you know, for specific events um, to kind of resist the urge to prepare ahead of time for that and just, you know, kind of refocus our attention on, well, how do we feel good in our bodies? Like Mm -hmm. what are the things that make us feel our best? Um, And kind of focus on, again, the adding instead of the taking away. How can we have more of that? Yeah, that's good. Uh, You know, I think about clients that I see in myself and, you know, it feels good to be in better shape. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels good to uh, work out and, you know, have more tone or more muscles or be able to see your abs or be able to do whatever. Yeah. And my brain goes, well, why does it feel good? (laughs) You know what I mean? I think that's the the point of this podcast and us talking through it is to peel back the layers. And it's like, well, it feels good because aesthetically Mm -hmm. I'm more pleasing to myself. And it's because I know I'm more pleasing to other people. Right. Right. Like, yeah, because we have a culture that says what is a 
appealing aesthetically mm-hmm. that is different than 50 years ago or a hundred years ago oh, absolutely. or a thousand years ago. Yeah. So it's like, is that a good, like, mm-hmm. is the goal good that like, I'm not actually asking myself or my wife or my husband what I think is appealing, Yeah. but I'm really basing what makes me get dopamine and feel good about myself mm-hmm. on what the culture and society views even though I would say nobody actually cares. Right. Like yeah. you know, we talked about this before, but like most women mm-hmm. don't care if their husband has a six pack. Yeah. Right. Like if you have kids right now and you're married, like <laughs> sure you don't want your husband to be out of shape, but like if your husband's at the gym three to three hours a day yeah. after work or in the morning, what's he not doing with your five and four year old or your two and seven year old or right. the diapers or whatever? Yeah. It's like, that's great that you're in shape and that makes you feel good. Mm-hmm. But you know, at you being healthy and yeah. still going to the gym and still taking care of yourself versus the extra hour and a half or time for meal prep or whatever the thing you're doing that's taking away from your family yeah. and your time at home. Mm-hmm. I'm sure most wives would go, I would prefer him to have a little more fat around his stomach yeah. and be at home and be present yeah. than have a 12 pack that makes him feel mm-hmm. good. And then the question is, okay, so then for you as if I had the guy, I'm like, for you as an individual, how much of a, a percentage of your happiness right, yeah. is based on having the abs versus being a good father mm-hmm. and being present and the other people in your life being content with the relationship they have with you? Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm just yeah. externalizing, but... Mm-hmm. No, it that? does. Yeah. You know, is that part of the problem? I guess it, yeah, it can be, you know, it's like, are your priorities in the right place? Right. You know, if your value is taking care of yourself, that's great. Our bodies were made to move. Sure. Like movement is a really positive thing. Um, so doing that, you know, is, is on like on a regular basis, as long as it's sustainable, that's a good thing. But keeping that in check with your other values, you know, is, movement taking over um, other aspects of your life? Mm-hmm. Are you canceling social events so that way you don't miss the gym? You know, are you neglecting your family at home because you've got to get in that workout today or you can't miss that class, right? Um, are you working out when you're sick or you're injured? Like those are all things that can show you that your your actions are not in alignment with your values or well, you don't know what your values are. I think that's part of the question yeah, right? when true. they come to us and, yeah. you know, come see you is that people – People aren't thinking about, okay, I wake up on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. We've got to hit that run. I've got to go do this thing. We we have a birthday party at three. We show up at the birthday party and we've already worked out for three hours, Mm -hmm. you know, and we took our kids and put them in the daycare so we can get it done again, not saying that's evil or awful, but the question goes and and people would say, well, I have to, because man, I feel so good when I do. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what are you? why can't we feel good doing other things? Yeah. You know, why isn't being at home playing board games on a Saturday morning? Why doesn't that bring you the same level of joy Mm -hmm. as being in really good shape? Yeah. And it's like, well, there's some science behind it. Working out does release endorphins. Mm -hmm. It does help you. It, you know, reduces, releases dopamine and serotonin. Yeah. What I'm trying to, you know, thread the needle on is like, how much compared to this? Like how right. many hours do you need to be doing this and dedicating mm-hmm. yourself to it? And when does it kind of fall over into, well, really it's now it's a obsession or an yeah. unhealthy level of focus. Yeah. And I think you're saying when it's costing you other areas of your life. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the questions I like to ask too is like how much time during the day do you spend thinking about food and body image? Mm-hmm. You know, if that is a significant portion of your day, and I have clients that estimate like 95% of my day mm-hmm. is spent thinking about these things. Well, how much of that time do you wish would go to other things? You know, or do you recognize like, I don't want to be thinking about these things all the time, mm-hmm. you know? And so, or thinking about it occupies your mind from 40 yeah. other things that you need to be thinking about. So you see That's that as right. a positive thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I think about jujitsu all day or think about therapy all day or think about whatever the thing, you know, thing yeah. is I do, you know, rowing all day. And so I don't think about mm-hmm. all the other stuff. So yeah. it can be used as a tool to avoid really just dealing with life too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's like, well, by dedicating this amount of time to whatever that activity is, right? Like, what is it that you're not like, what's, what else is missing in your life? You know, mm-hmm. what are you avoiding or what are you kind of miss, um, Oh goodness. Like, what are you kind of, 
uh, what's the right word? Like shifting it to? <laughs> yeah. You know, kind of like what's the, um, you know, what are you not able to give your time to mm-hmm. because you're spending so much time thinking about these other things? Is your work performance suffering? Is your mental health suffering? Is your relationship suffering? You know? Well, that's the key is yeah. I would ask somebody's husband or wife, mm-hmm. you know, what do you think? Yeah. You know, and whatever the thing is, if they go, yeah, like I, I'm, I'm glad they, I think this is such a problem in marriage. I know we're getting off all kinds of tangents, but like, <laughs> you know, when, yeah. when someone in a marriage is like, this thing makes me feel really good. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to spend all of my time doing it Yeah, at the, and the spouse is going, well, it makes them feel really good and I need them to be happy right? for the little time I get with them. Yeah. So now they need to do that every day or multiple times a week or for Mm -hmm. hours so that when I get them back, they're at least happy. Yeah. It's like, what are we putting our happiness on? Mm -hmm. And I think that plays into diet culture and health and fitness and body image. Yeah. Body image and all these things. Yeah. You know, it's like, am if, if we're constantly striving to meet this idea of like the, you know, whatever culture's perfect body is in the moment. Yeah. Today. Today, yeah, Yeah, because that's always shifting, right? Um, And, you know, we're neglecting other things that are more important in our lives. Then what is it really for, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I think if we put a Christian lens on this, right, and a biblical lens and go, okay, well, that's in some ways idolatry. Mm-hmm. You know, like we're yeah. idolizing ourselves. And That's our, right. Our, our, our You're worshiping at the altar of the quote unquote, like perfect body. Yeah. That's going to yeah. change literally mm-hmm. every year. And that is dying. And, and that, that you can't keep either. Like our bodies will get older and they will wrinkle and, you know, they'll break down and we won't be able to, to uphold that. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, it, it's kind of focusing on something that is never going to be sustainable or even attainable for so many people. Yeah, for sure. I saw this video. It's it's old, I think, but um, it was this old man, and he was uh, he had, he was in his garage. He's probably in his like eighties, and he has. Have you seen this? And he's got mm. this uh, uh, kettlebell, yeah. and he's squatting and he's lifting it over and over. And then it's it's like the winter, and his neighbors are looking through the window, and he's squatting and bending down and lifting this kettlebell over his head and over yeah. and over and over again. It's it's a pretty long like video of seasons and him doing this. And then um, his kids show up Mm -hmm. and they walk in and then the granddaughter comes down the stairs and he's got a bow tie on and uh, it's Christmas. And he he leans over and takes his granddaughter and he picks her up and he holds her up to put her to put the star on the top of the tree. Yeah. And so that's the kind of stuff that like, yes, we should exercise and take Mm -hmm. care of our bodies and be fit Yeah. because we should be able to play with our kids. We should be able to fall off the bed and not, you know, die. We should be able to like, right. you know, get up all yeah. out of this chair on the podcast table and not yeah. be like, oh God, we sat here for an hour, you know, killing mm-hmm. me. But yeah. some of that, no matter how good of shape you're in, is going to hurt. It's going to come with age. Yeah, exactly. Bodies like, are inherently uncomfortable. So you can aesthetically yeah. look good and yet, and yet not necessarily be functional. That's a good point. Like I have, you know, clients that, uh, that do exercise all the time, um, often at the cost of their own like physical health. And so, you know, some of them are in significant amounts of pain, Mm -hmm. you know, they look very muscular and, you know, by all appearances from the world, it looks like they're taking care of themselves, but they're miserable all the time. Their body hurts all the time. It's so funny because yeah. it feels like we're trying to tell people to like not be in shape. <laughs> yes. I know we're not right. saying that. No. But it's interesting in the world where obesity is like one of the number one killers in America that, you know, you want to get on a, on a podcast about health and be like, you yeah. need to get it together, country. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you need to start working out. You need to take care of yourself. Like, our kids are on technology every day. Mm-hmm. They're eating, you know, McDonald's like it's going out of style. It, you know, all of these negative things. Yeah. That's a whole nother podcast, right? Mm-hmm. I just want to be clear about yeah, that. You like, know, I take issue with the word obese. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, uh, but my point is, is that like, yeah, that is killing us in all kinds of areas and, and obesity, right? What you're saying and what we're talking about today is a layered thing. Mm. All things are layered. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, it, but especially when we're saying the word obesity, it's not just, oh, people are eating too much and that's why they're dying. Mm-hmm. It's all these things we're talking about today. Our worldviews, yeah. our focus, our family systems, our mm-hmm. emotions, you know, our worth and value being tied into these things. Yeah. And yes, also, and this is where I always push against you, and yes, also, if you're eating McDonald's three days a week, yeah. 
right? Yes, that's because of all kinds of emotional issues, mm -hmm. but also like if your body, and this is my question, if yeah. your body, right, obesity wise is way overweight for your body type, that there's a negativity, a negative thing that comes with that health wise, correct? Um, I, it can be like, so again, it's complicated, right? Oh, so we're here to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, there's this, um, something that's really helpful that helps describe like all of the, um, what's called the social determinants of health. And mm -hmm. you're probably familiar with that, but you know, for those of you who aren't, um, it just shows like that there's so many different factors that go into health overall. And one of them is the physical, right? So physical would be your sleep patterns, your eating patterns, your movement patterns, like those are all things, but there's also genetics. So that would be like biology, genetics, um, and your body shape. Those mm -hmm. are all determined by your genetic blueprint. So, you know, um, your genetic blueprint is not something that can be changed right? It's the body that we were given. You're, and so that's where body diversity really comes in. Um, I will definitely want to push back against the idea that like, you know, that all people are supposed to be in smaller or average type bodies. Mm -hmm. Like what does average even mean? The average woman's size is actually a size 16. So pushing back against the idea that like, it's got to be like a, you know, a different size, like a much yeah. smaller size. Um, body diversity is a real thing. And I think that that's also partly by design, right? Um, but there's other factors. Environment plays a big role too. Um, you know, that might be socioeconomic status, the ability to access food. So there's, you know, layers of privilege in here as well. Like, you know, for those that are eating McDonald's three times a day, like, is that because they run really good, you know, promos and deals at McDonald's and that's mm -hmm. less, you know, expensive than them actually going to a grocery store. Yeah. You know, what that brings up for me is like, again, how, there's all these conversations out there and there's yeah. all these podcasts and Instagram reels and, you know, all these things. And yet outside of relationship, you can't really figure out what it is that mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Right. So from the stage, right. If you were doing a talk or I'm doing a talk, people are like, huh, what do you do with this? And it's like, well, I don't know. I have to sit down with that person. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends. That's my <laughs> yeah. answer for everything. Yeah. A hundred percent. And so it's like, you know, th that's what we're trying to push people to mm -hmm. by having these podcasts is not to just dump information into people's brains and say, Hey, th yeah. these diet cultures are bad or these things are good, but it's to help people like stir up their thought about what they do and why they do it. Mm -hmm. And especially as Christians, our body is the temple mm -hmm. and we can go real crazy yeah. and real rigid. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, but the reality is, is there's theology there that goes, yes, it is important to maintain our bodies. But I remember going through when I had my little one, one of my mental breakdowns over my life, uh, in my <laughs> early twenties. Yeah. Um, I remember, man, I was like focused on sin and how everything was sinful. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, then I, I have to just eliminate all sin in my life and modify my behavior. And you could say sugar or you could say, you know, whatever food ingredient. Yeah. Um, and I remember watching this like Honda van commercial and thinking everything in that thing is sinful. Like there's yeah. marketing and there's these people have this house and this luxury and these things. And I, it just was a lot. And I think that, you know, we can be obsessive that way when mm -hmm. it comes to food, when it comes to anything. Yeah. And then we, we don't know how to live our lives and drink a Coke without thinking it's sinful. Mm -hmm. right? right. Cause it's like, if your body's the temple, yeah. then you should literally, okay. Then we should like manufacture the most healthy environment for it ever, yeah. which means ice cream has X number of calories and X number of fat, which means it's bad mm -hmm. because, and I, and my body's the temple. So I can't put anything in it that's bad. I can't yeah. look at anything that's not the, the most pure, you know, whatever. Right, yeah. And so yeah. I think that's also part of the culture within church is like not having good conversations about yeah. how to apply scripture and understand that like mm -hmm. your body is the temple. Yeah. But like it's it's still your intentions and your heart posture with so many things. Right. Now I you mean, can't do meth and be healthy, but I'm just saying like <laughs> maybe, you know, eating some ice cream is not yeah, a moral right. issue. And I love that you just brought up moral issue because that's where I was going next is that, you know, when we put labels on food, good, bad, clean, dirty, you know, healthy and unhealthy, right? Mm -hmm. What we're really doing is we're assigning morality to food. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just like, Oh, this food is good or this food is bad. It's when I eat this food that I've just called bad. Well, I must be bad for mm -hmm. doing that. And food has no moral value, you know, and that's not the same thing as saying that, you know, 
that nutritionally they're all equal. Like we know that's not the case. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say that, but morally all foods are equal. You're not a better person for eating in certain ways and you're not a worse person for eating in other ways mm-hmm. because, you know, with those moral values assigned to food, it can be very easy to descend into shame and guilt around our food choices. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that goes into the idea that like, okay, so you're not a moral person, you know, no matter what, you know, a better person or a worse person, depending on what you put in your mouth. Mm -hmm. So then you go, okay, well, what's the reason I'm putting ice cream in my mouth today versus a salad? Mm -hmm. Can we we make that measurement? Is that that bad? (laughs) Um, Well, again, it's not that it's bad. It's just that it's complicated. Yeah. So I'm coming home, right? Like I'm, 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 I don't feel good about myself. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm overwhelmed. Um, you know, and there's a perfectly good salad that I know is delicious in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm like, you know what? That ice cream is going to taste way better. Yeah. You know, uh, it's going to give me dopamine It's gonna make me feel good. Mm -hmm. Right. So my goal in eating in that moment is more emotionally driven yeah. than it is like for the betterment of my body and my health. Would you mm-hmm. say that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's not good mm-hmm. on some level if that's what you're doing every single time you're doing anything, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that was the distinction that I was going to make. Is mm-hmm. this like, is this like a one-off occasion where you're like, mm. I'm just going to have a Sunday for dinner instead of a salad. Um, or is this like something that you're engaging in on a regular basis? Because then the question is just like your podcast, like asking why, why is it that you're often reaching for, you know, these more, uh, you know, like sweeter type foods, Instant you know, gratification. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, because by design, they taste really good and they make you feel better in the moment. But again, you know, with everything being rooted in like what's sustainable, well, how long does that last? <laughs> Well, I mean, usually by the end of it, I'm miserable and wish I wouldn't have eaten all that ice cream, right? That's the other side of it. Yeah. Sometimes I eat it and I go, man, that was really good. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, quote unquote, deserve that, which is a whole nother thing, right? (laughs) (laughs) But that's going to drive you crazy. I don't say that. (laughs) No, that's right. Don't say it. Uh, But, you know, your brain's like, when you think through all the ways we think and the words and the verbiage that we have for food and I deserve it and I didn't, Mm -hmm. it's a treat and it's this and that. There's so much like emotional psychology. Yeah. The implication is that we have to earn our food or that we have to reward ourselves with some behavior, with some food item. Mm -hmm. And if like, truthfully, we need to separate those things. Yeah. No, it's good. And if we go a layer deeper, okay, so whether I'm putting ice cream in my mouth or a salad in my mouth to Mm -hmm. eat, you're talking about morality. I wanted to dive yeah. in that a little bit deeper. You know, it's like, okay, so Christianity says that we are not moral except mm-hmm. for what Christ says that we are and what he did. Yeah. So doesn't matter. Right. Right. It, it yeah. matters in, this, in, in the extent of your heart posture and, and like, mm-hmm. why am I going to this thing? Am I going to this thing to worship God? And yeah. To, am I filling a God-shaped hole with food? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So talk about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. How has that been like, yeah. because be, I know like even intuitive eating is a very secularized Absolutely. You know, model. So yeah. what's that been like for you and how, how do you work with your clients a little differently or do you, um, mm-hmm. or what are you kind of figuring out yeah. on integrating kind of eating into a theology or a worldview? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Big question. <laughs> yeah, You're welcome. of course, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, so for those that want to dive in and, you know, I always let my clients like lead the discussion, right? Like, so if they are mentioning you mean when they show up, you don't say you have to be a Christian to, to eat. <laughs> exactly. No. Um, yeah. You know, if they identify that as one of their values or if they mention that, I ask them, would you like to bring faith into the conversation? Mm-hmm. And so if they do, then we can dive into God's design, right? Mm-hmm. Like, because the Bible actually has a lot lot of things to say about food and its rightful place and what God has to say about our worth and value, right? That's very much tied to the, the body image conversation. You know, the fact that we're made in his image and, you know, that all things should be in their proper places, right? So that's back to not putting food as an idol, not putting body image as an idol. Um, but, you know, when it comes to kind of coping with all of life's struggles, right? You know, for believers, if they're not kind of placing God in in their lives where they should be, mm-hmm. right? There's some kind of spiritual void and that they're trying to fill it with the things of this world. It will never work. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to constantly be striving to try and um, feel better. And, and it's all temporal things, right? Yeah. Like it's all very short-lived things, you know? 
but when they can really kind of focus on what God intended for our lives, right, is to be in relationship with him and to worship him, then all of these other things, whether it's food or whether it's body image, like all of those things seem really small. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I think, you know, when I think about the the Garden of Eden and I think about before the fall, yeah, you know, the animals didn't die. Mm -hmm. So there was no meat to eat. Yeah. Right. Um, There was just plants and water. Mm-hmm. I just don't think, you know, food was this thing that like was going to be this huge issue right. before the fall because there wasn't like an obsession with all the ways in which we can create and curate and make food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now we have this, this, uh, you know, if you're a chef, listen to this, you're like, dude, you know, like, yeah, cause it what is, are you talking yeah, about? it is a yeah. beauty that we now have the the ability to create and cook and do all these things and make these masterpieces. And I'm not saying that's wrong in Mm -hmm. their proper place. Right. Just like anything else. Yeah. And yes, look, theologians, you know, Paul, Jesus gave us permission to eat meat afterwards. I'm not saying we shouldn't eat meat. Even even though there's a big documentary now, apparently I haven't watched it yet about like how Jesus would have never told us to eat meat and all this stuff, but I need Mm -hmm. to dive into that. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, you know, yeah. comment on Instagram if you know, um, and light me up if you disagree. But, uh, <laughs> the reality is, is, you know, I'm not yeah. getting into whether you should be vegan or eat meat or any of that stuff, but from a theological perspective, mm-hmm. but what I'm trying to point to is in the garden, you know, sex, food, all of these things that we have propped up marriage, yeah. like they, they were not God, right? Right. God was the focus, the yeah. relationship with God, the relationship with humans, mm-hmm. you know, intimacy, connection, family, yeah. relationship. That is who God is. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't think he eats, and, you know, like, <laughs> so I'm just yeah. saying like, there's this, if yeah. we're made in his image, he's given us, you know, food and he's mm-hmm. given us these things that we need or we'll die. Yeah. But they weren't used in the same way when we wouldn't die. Yeah. So it's just an interesting thought process of heaven. And when Christ right. comes to restore all things, mm-hmm. you know, people are like, oh, I'll be able to eat whatever I want. We'll have the most sex mm-hmm. we can ever have. Like yeah. we'll have the perfect bodies with abs and be able to run and jump and yeah. do. And it's like even that thought process yeah. starts to point at, right, our idolatry. Right. That makes sense. Our sinful nature. Yeah. yeah because yeah. Uh, the truth is we're not going to care about any of those things. <laughs> Like there might be the most delicious food, but we'll be like, okay, yeah, but there's Jesus, like, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so just to point back to the Bible, like, you know, all of the, the like ceremonies and like festivals and all of the, the things that the communities right gathered around, they were all around the table. So like food is a very big part of not only the Bible's culture, but our culture again today. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it should be a part of the conversation, but in its right place. Right. You know, so satisfaction, what you're talking about, like with chefs designing food and, and we don't have to make it that complicated or that intricate, but you know, I, I think satisfaction from food is by design, by God's design. And so that's an incredible thing that we not only have food that we can eat, but that we actually enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But again, it shouldn't be pleasure seeking all the time, right? It shouldn't be this thing where I'm like, okay, how do I make myself feel better? Or how do I get pleasure from this thing? And it doesn't matter if it's food or like you said, if it's sex or if it's drugs or if it's relationships, like whatever it is, Mm -hmm. you know, we have to think about, well, what are we actually looking for? What's missing? That's so good. It's like, is the, is the situation just self-fulfilling? Yeah. You know, I'm, am I trying to create the best food possible just for me mm-hmm. so that I get all the flavors and yeah. all the things that I get out of it and all the nutrients are all, all over the whatever. Mm-hmm. So I'm glorified. Yeah. So my body can be a certain thing so I can have a certain amount of peace and dopamine so I can have enough pleasure in my life that I'm okay with all the rest of it. Yeah. Or is it a communal relational thing? And I would say mm-hmm. for Christians, like the, right. the Bible around food is always communal. Yeah. You know, it's, it's around a table. Yeah. It's Jesus saying, yeah. hey, you know, here's my body broken for you. Mm-hmm. Eat of it. Here's my blood. Drink of it. Yeah. You know, we did communion this morning with our biblical counselors, and it's like it's that reminder, and we do it at our church every week. You know. Yeah. And it's just that reminder of how the body is important. That mm-hmm. God came and and lived in a body and was incarnate yeah. in a body, and so that's not bad. Mm-hmm. And I right. think even that theology plays into all the food culture, all the body culture, all the shaming. Yeah is like, you know, just our bodies are either good or bad, you know, just this kind of 
bifurcated way of looking right. at you know human human beings. Yeah. So anyway, it's good stuff. Mm-hmm. Any uh, closing thoughts or comments or you know anything that we're missing that you want to hit on? I know you could talk for hours, but. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, just to give some encouragement, I think, to the parents that are out there, since so many of them, you know, kind of tune into your podcast, is mm-hmm. that, you know, we have the ability to be a very powerful tool in our kids' lives. And so if you've made mistakes, like we all do in parenting every day, um, it's okay. It's never too late for you to, you know, depending on the age and maturity level of your child, like to have a conversation and say, like, hey, you know, I may have once, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe said some negative things about my own body. And yeah, let's let's do that real quick. We have a few yeah. more minutes. So what okay. are some of the top, like, things as a parent or as a spouse, and you mm-hmm. can do either one, yeah. that, like, you would say, hey, we need to stop saying this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we need to stop commenting on other people's bodies mm. <laughs> and our own body, yeah. right? I know. We're constantly uh, talking to our kids about that. Yeah, you know, and it's not just uh, it's not just like the perceived compliments, right? Sure. Not just like, well, here's one thing that I hear in my clients all the time is that either you know my parent like my parent criticized their own body or my parent made comments about me having the perfect body. Oh yes, man, I have clients yeah. all the time whose dads will say, yeah. "Hey, you haven't been working out. Like, I can tell you gained some weight. You need to take care of yourself." Mm-hmm. You yeah. Know, or even if it's not related to them, like say you're, you know, walking around a grocery store and you start commenting on other people's bodies, it doesn't matter that you weren't talking to your child. They're absorbing that mm-hmm. message to say, okay, well, if I look like that, then that's what my parents going to feel about yeah. me, you know? So, well, which is so subjective because, yeah. right. I mean, how many yeah. people have body dysmorphia and when we look at the mirror think mm-hmm. I look terrible, Yeah, you know, CJ and I talk about this all the time. Like I remember yeah. being in Afghanistan and doing steroids mm-hmm. so I can get more muscular, you know, so I could be 215 pounds at 20 yeah. years old and just be this monster of a meat machine. Mm-hmm. And yet when I looked at other guys in the gym, I remember thinking, oh, yeah. man, they're so much bigger than I am. Yeah. And CJ would go, dude, you're literally like 40 more pounds than them. <laughs> Hulk. Right. But like you, I, you can't get your brain <laughs> yeah. around it yeah. because you're chasing the wrong thing. It's for the wrong purpose. So, of course, mm-hmm. it's going to be distorted in your mind yeah. because you just have no good measure of yourself. Right. You know, little, yeah. little smaller bodied women. Right. Mm-hmm. Learning. Yeah. They, you know, they look at other women and yeah. think, oh, my gosh, you know. I'm bigger than them. You know, we joke yeah. about this all the time with you and JC. She's shorter and, and mm-hmm. has a smaller body than you do. Yeah. And yet she thinks you're the same height, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. She's petite for everybody who doesn't know. And right, I'm right. not. Right. But so, it's like, it's so funny yeah. that like our perspectives of that, you know, mm-hmm. are just so skewed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and part of that starts with this like, um, message that we, kind of share and that's commonly talked about is, you know, around like there's this one ideal, you know, and for everyone who doesn't measure up to that ideal, then we've all kind of failed in some Mm. way and we all have to try and fix it. And I think that if we can help to kind of spread the message to our kids about body diversity, right? Like that. And if you're a believer, it's that God made us in all sizes and shapes. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of my clients, I tell them, okay, if you can't, if you can't picture this with your body itself, like just think about your feet, Yeah. (laughs) you know, think about the size and shape of your feet. What do you do with that information, Mm -hmm. right? Do you try to shrink it? Do you try to get it bigger? Like try to make your feet more muscular? Like, no, you just accept Well, some people do your feet. Yeah, that would be weird. Like toe scrunches. (laughs) Um, But, you know, you accept the size and shape of your feet and you try to find comfortable shoes, right? You don't always have to like it, but hopefully you're trying to take care of them in the best way possible. Well, it's usually, if you don't like it, it's usually because somebody's pointing something out about it. Oh, absolutely. You know, but I, mean, I, oh, yeah. I, I say that and then I yeah. go, I think about Grady, my mm-hmm. oldest, and I think about like he yeah. has more of a sway back, you know, in, his, in yeah. his body shape. And we were talking about this the other day that, you know, he came out of the bathroom and was like, I don't like, you know, the sway back. I wish yeah. that it was straighter like everybody else's, mm-hmm. which he's going to grow out of. It's just a, you know, development thing. Yeah. But the fact that we've literally never said anything about it. Right. You know, I didn't even know what that was called, but I mean, I've noticed it, but I've never even thought about it. Yeah. And JC has, you know, said, oh yeah, he's got a little bit of sway back to me, not in mm-hmm. front of him. But we, that's not something we've talked about more than like three times. Cause you're like, yeah. it'll just it'll grow out of it. It's just a little thing mm-hmm. and just a body type, you know, yeah. body shape. 
And uh, but the fact that he's noticed it mm -hmm. and commenting on it at nine years old oh, without yeah. us saying anything about it, yeah. it just talks about how how gentle and kind and graceful we need to be and sensitive when we talk about bodies because right. they already have sin. We already have insecurities. Mm -hmm. We already have things that Satan is attacking us with That's as right. children. We don't need help. No, <laughs> you know, like yeah, we don't need to add fuel to that fire for sure. Mm -hmm. Any anything else? Yeah. I know cleaning your plate yeah. is like a, or making a happy plate. That's one oh, of those ones man. that yeah. drive you crazy. Yeah. No, that's a hard one too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, modeling, right? So modeling the behaviors that you want to see in your children. And, and by this, of course, I mean like the positive behaviors that you can model. And so, you know, I might comment, I've got two kids, eight and six. And so, you know, I might comment like, Ooh, you know, mommy's tummy's full. Right. So I'm letting them know as I push away my plate that I'm listening to my body. Mm -hmm. Right. And so sometimes that plate is empty in front of me and sometimes it's not. And so they're receiving the message without me ever saying a word about how much food that I've just eaten. Mm. So you're not making the amount of food the, the no. focus. You're making what mm -mm. your body feels like and what you feel good yeah. about. Yeah, because they can see that. They can pick up on that, you know. Right. And so always trying to connect them to their bodies because some kids are naturally more kind of attuned to the messages that are happening to their bodies and that their kids need help with mm -hmm. what that feels like. Yeah. And so trying to give them, yeah, we both have experience with that in yep. our kids, um, but trying to give them the language for that of like, okay, well, have you listened to your body? Are you hungry? Are you full, right? Like, did you eat enough or do you, did you just like get bored and get it from the table? You know, mm. so giving them the language. Yeah, exactly. In our kids. Yeah. Um, so, you know, giving them that language of like, it's okay to check in with your body. It's okay to, you know, have some trust in that way. And so, you know, modeling that behavior without like directly trying to control in any way your kid's relationship with food, <laughs> because mm -hmm. they're already going to be getting a lot of that, you know, themselves through learning, you know, how to nurse their body and what it feels like. Right. But helping them to identify those things. And so that starts a lot of times with uh, meals around the table together as often as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect. Sometimes there's lots of chaos. Sometimes that's not possible because of schedules, you know, or different life circumstances. But, you know, if you can share a meal with them, like they get to see things that they wouldn't otherwise get to see. Mm -hmm. They get to see you, you know, listen to your own body. They get to see you eat foods that currently they don't want to eat <laughs> and that's okay like having them around the table you know a lot of times especially in my eight-year-old will be like "Ooh, what's that can i try it and mm -hmm. she's eating it off of my plate because it looks interesting to her as long and as it's so, not french fries i'm fine <laughs> yeah don't touch my fries <laughs> i'll smack your hands that's no right. i'm just kidding um but you know yeah so they're they're growing more interested and curious um mm -hmm. in that way through modeling those behaviors so you know parents if you want your kids to eat more vegetables Maybe you eat more vegetables. Ooh, burn. Um, yeah, there's there's your challenge there. What are um, what are vegetables? What are those? Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's great. Yeah. I, I think I mean we need to you know do a whole nother. I like have so many things off of this podcast that we. Can I know talk we about. didn't get half to the body image. Half of the body well, we'll, we'll just do it again. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we can do it sooner now that we got the podcast set up. Um, yeah. So. One of the things I was thinking, that just to narrow this back down to community and family, is like, yeah, so many of these things, yeah. like all the principles of Jesus, is by practicing the way of Jesus, mm -hmm. is following people and living their life. So as parents, yeah. as friends, as spouses, if we want other people to have healthy relationships with food, mm -hmm. then we have to work on our healthy relationship with food. That's and when right. we find ourselves having areas in our life that we don't feel like are healthy, yeah, then we have to seek counsel and mm -hmm. advice and guidance so that we can go and we can hold it and go, is this healthy? Is this not? Right. What do I really think about this? Why am I really doing this mm -hmm. thing? Because Paul says everything is permissible, yeah. but not everything is good. So right. CrossFit, jujitsu, swimming, running, you know, all of these things are all good things. Yeah. And you can engage in all of them in a healthy way, mm -hmm. but not all of them are good for you when you're doing them in some way that yeah. are toxic. Right. Now, there are things in life, like I said earlier, like doing meth, you can't do in moderation. And no. Paul is not saying, yeah. you know, everything that you want to do is permissible. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, what he is also saying is that your body is not your own. Yeah. Right. And as Christians, sure, everything's permissible, mm -hmm. but you, none of it's yours anyway. Yeah. And so yeah. if you have that perspective, now we're shaping what we eat and what we do and how we do it into right. a worldview as Christians that goes, oh, this is all God's stuff. 
And yeah. so I'm giving it to him and I'm glorifying him. And my goal is to glorify mm-hmm. him and bring the light to the world, not light to Clint or Ashley or whoever. Yeah, we have to be ready for God's calling on our lives. And so, you know, if you're ultimately not taking care of yourself in a wide variety of ways, right, then you're probably not going to be as prepared for if God calls you to move or to do something or to help someone out, right? So, you know, that's part of it is that, you know, because our body's not our own, we should be treating it with kindness because we're made in God's image. That's good. So, you know, instead of some of the conversations of, um, which, you know, again, we don't have time to get into today, but, you know, the negative comments that we can make about our own bodies um, or the shame or the, you know, name calling and things that can happen, recognizing that, you know, when you call yourself those things and you say those negative things about yourself, you're reflecting on God's creation Mm -hmm. in a negative way. And God doesn't want that for us. That's good. And other people. And other people. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, Ashley. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, if you want to find Ashley, can you give them like your ats and all that stuff? Uh, Sure. Yeah. So um, best way to reach me is at my website. Um, That's www.fulfillednutritiontherapy.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram, um, at fulfilled nutrition dot therapy <laughs> and on Facebook. Um, you can find me at fulfilled nutrition therapy. Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. I'll look that up. We'll tag it in the links. Um, we hope you guys have a good day. It's the summer, so yeah. we didn't really get into body image around uh, all that stuff, but I would say, yeah. um, you know, turn off Instagram, turn off social media, Stop looking at people in bathing suits mm-hmm. and measuring yourself against them. You know, yeah. look if you have a body, you have a beach body already. That's right. I love that quote. That's yeah, me too. I didn't come up with it, but yeah. good we'll, one. We'll say you did. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. God bless you and have a good week.